we don't think about it, but the way writing does have, uh, it's such a big thing. It has such a big influence in how we use language as literate people. It's very hard to imagine uh, not having that literacy. What, what life would be like if we didn't have that, like it did in India two and a half thousand years ago. Um, and it does affect it, it affects how we think, it affects how we uh, use language. Thank you for watching this video. Please help us keep the show alive by liking and sharing this video and by subscribing to the show and making sure the notification button switched on. For those of you who can help a little bit more, there's a Patreon link down below where you can contribute whatever you can. Every little does help and all the money will go directly back into the show. You can also keep up with our latest content on Instagram at The No Show Pod, as you can see on the screen. As you know, The No Show is an initiative designed to make academic research accessible to everyone. So do contribute to the conversation, leave some questions, have a discussion, and I'll make sure I get back to everyone. Uh, John, thank you so much for joining me on The No Show. I'm really pleased to have you. It's a pleasure. Um, so when we were sort of looking for academics we came across your profile and one of the interesting things um you know that that caught my attention was um you you saw you have been looking at the sanskrit language um but you you look at it with from a from a linguistic um lens uh, which is very interesting and it's not something that um i've come across so tell me what the what does that entail um, it can it can entail a number of different things, uh, but primarily, yeah, it's looking at Sanskrit texts and looking at you know, looking at the language. So, of course, you know, it's good to understand these texts in terms of their literary and their, their cultural uh, content, what what they say, and um, but looking at the language and how the language works, you know, what the what the sort of structures are that underlie how sentences are put together. Um, is a th yeah a really interesting question for me and um, yeah it involve can involve close close reading it looking at a lot of different texts a lot of different examples and bringing together a lot of data and saying well you know, what patterns are there what things are possible what things are not possible I and mean, it's it's different working on languages like this from working on English you know in English we can say um, well these things are grammatical you can say these things but you can't say this you know this this kind of sentence is impossible. Um, with a language like Sanskrit, it's harder to do that because we can't go and ask some native speakers mm -hmm. um, anymore. I mean, no, no one is a uh, no, one, no one grew up speaking only Sanskrit. Um, so, yeah, uh, there's there's other aspects to it as well. You know, there's uh, uh, so another part of my research is um, comparing how uh, the Indian tradition understood its own language. So they have a sophisticated tradition of linguistic analysis um, and understanding how they understood their language and the sorts of rules and principles that they felt were at work. And then looking at that from a modern linguistic perspective and saying, well, how does that correlate with uh, the sorts of things that we do in modern linguistics, the sort of concepts that we have, the sort of an analyses we have is another interesting question. It's very interesting because, you know, when you're approaching linguistics in general, um, approaching linguistics with a, with a modern language is hard enough, but when you're doing it with a language that isn't, you know, in existence, mm. um, in the spoken form, um, just sounds incredibly difficult. And, and it sounds like you have to rely um, a lot on assumptions of academics made before you. Um, in terms of, well, in terms of how these things are understood, uh, I think, I think it's certainly true that uh, in in linguistic analysis, there's a, a you know, tr tradition plays a role, and, and the way the way some things have been traditionally understood uh, still plays an important role in the way that people think about things. Um, but I, I I hope that the uh, at least a good part of my, my work challenges that or doesn't depend on that too much. I mean, I think that what you can do, of course, is uh, you know, question these assumptions and look at the texts 
as far as you can uh, with with the fresh eyes and um, entertain other possibilities. I suppose, you know, ent yeah, entertain sure. other possibilities and then see whether they work. You know, see if they work better. I, I want to get more um, into into the research, but before I do, I want to sort of ask, um, you know. Before you got into this research, what came first for you? Was it the interest in languages, or was it um, was it the interest in linguistics and the composition of words and and that sort of stuff, or was it the interest in in India and Sanskrit? Um, I think uh, probably languages in the in 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 the beginning. Uh, so I I suppose I began life as a as a classicist. I did Latin and Greek and. Um, I was particularly interested in the language side of that, uh, as opposed to say the sort of ancient history side or something like that. Um, and that got me into Sanskrit because these languages are historically related. Um, and I, so I wanted to, to learn Sanskrit as well and uh, understand how that works alongside Latin and Greek. Um, but I, you know, so I suppose a part of that, part of being interested in languages and how they work, is kind of being interested in language structure. And that came for me, academically came later, um, after I'd learned Sanskrit and after I, Sanskrit would really became my main focus, but um, I suppose it was always there. But yeah, it, uh, that was the, the latest part of my, my academic development, I suppose, in that sense. And it's, and it's very interesting you describe it as a development because um, one, of, one, one, one bit of research that you're doing or you, that you've done, um, is really really interesting because you sort of look at the the you look at words and the makeup of of the words from these discrete units of letters that we you know like uh, like like you described like a cat cat is ka, a, ta, or mm. cat and mm. you break it down in the these segments but you what you suggest is that other language other languages haven't seen these segments as the, comp the composition of their language and instead you know rely on the on the syllables um now this is very interesting for me because um i remember not too long ago reading about um reading the, the work of ibn khaldun who is you know the the famous arab um sociologist but he i mean he did linguistics and he did all sorts of sort of sciences um and he has a, 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 a sort of a piece to say about this. Um, and he, and, and obviously describing the Arabic language. Um, and he was talking about the degradation of the language as a result of the written language. Because we res resorted to writing, we've degraded the language. Mm -hmm. And now, is this something that you feel is happening with in, in, these, in these languages that you're looking at? Um, well, it's, it's an interesting question. I mean, this uh, the question of writing and its effect on on language, or its uh, it's it's, imp it's important, its value, or its its uh, its uh, lack of value. I mean, is a, is a really interesting question in the Indian context. Um, I, mean, I, I don't, I'm not sure this precisely answers your question, but um, in, in the Indian context, it's very different from the Western context because uh, in the Indian context. It's the spoken word that is the authoritative and the most important. And in the, the sort of time that we're talking about, the sort of text that uh, we're talking about, um, uh, at, the, at the early period, you know, there, uh, to begin with, there was no writing. But then when writing did come along, they didn't use it for these texts. And the, the people who transmitted these texts um, shunned writing. And so, you know, writing, um, writing isn't authoritative. You, you make mistakes with writing. Right, but what you remember, what you uh, memorize and recite and pass down from teacher to student, um, that's authoritative. Uh, so you know, in, in terms of passing down the, the early Hindu scriptures, for example, and that's exactly the sort of thing that the early linguists in India were, were analyzing with these early Hindu scriptures. It's all done orally. It's all done uh, by memorization, recitation, and uh, learning by, by the next generation. And so there's certainly a sense that writing, um, you know, it's... It's not the real thing. It's not language. It's it's, it's not proper language. It's mm. it's uh, and yes, it can introduce errors and yeah. And I think it's certainly true that 
uh, we don't think about it, but the way writing does have, uh, it's such a big thing. It has such a big influence in how we use language as literate people. It's very hard to imagine uh, not having that literacy and how, what, what life would be like if we didn't have that, like they did in India two and a half thousand years ago. Um, and it does affect it. It affects how we think. It affects how we uh, use language. And that I think that is a really interesting question, an important question, because that's an, an important assumption of linguistic research is that you know, language has always basically been the same. You know, the way you know the way we speak now is a different language, but fundamentally, it's still human language in the way that you know, three, four, five, ten thousand years ago, um, humans spoke human language. Um, but for almost all of that time, there's not been writing. Um, and it's only now that actually something like writing can come in and, and affect uh, the way that our brains process language. Um, I suppose that does make it a bit different from the way human language has been for the majority of human history. It's also really, um, I think, interesting when you think of it moving forward um, and, and how things are changing for the future, because, you know, we're 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 here discussing when the the spoken language was converted into the into the written language, but now we're seeing forms of the written language changing as well. And you know now you're having all these like as a result of like texting and the use of social media and all these abbreviations and you know reductions of of the word to you know like a, a single letter. You know like mm. you, somebody would will, will text you, oh you know o m w or on my way mm. and you, there's an assumption that you have to assume so do you think this is just a, a like a a natural progression as a result of like of of language being written or do you think you know there are controls that can be had to sort of preserve some of that original you know language so there's a lot of interesting questions in there i think um I think that uh, it's, it's always hard to say how, how things will progress in, in the future. I suppose what we have now, you know, we have multiple different levels, right? You know, we have, so you do have, you have text, text speak, um, and you have you know, all, all these sorts of uh, abbreviations due, due to that kind of thing. But you have, you know, have high literature, you, know, you have newspapers, you have all sorts of written literature on a, on a, on a very big spectrum. And um, you know, I think what, what written language tends to do is to preserve older things. It, te mm -hmm. it tends to be a, a, pres a preservation mechanism. You know, it, it prevents things from changing. It can even undo the way things have changed. So um, you know, that there are words that nowadays tend to get pronounced as they're spelt. Um, and actually, it's not how they used to be pronounced or how we would pronounce them if we had never had writing. So forehead um, should be something like forehead. And some people, you know, you do say forehead. People do say forehead. But um, forehead is a perfectly good way of saying forehead. Um, and that's because people have taken that from the way we write it. Um, and there are other examples like that. Um, I think that uh, another interesting question is, you know, the, the way that sort of spelling conventions and so on progress and, and uh, yeah, in some sense, we have different cultural levels now. Um, uh, so in some sense, we have different cultural levels now. Uh, I mean, correct English, in, which is only, only correct because someone says it's correct. And then, you know, um, the way that, different cultures, uh, subcultures, youth cultures will write in, uh, in text messages. I mean, another really interesting question is the way that writing influences uh, the, way we, the way we speak. So um, mm -hmm. you know, something like lol, you know, for what you were saying, you know, um, mm -hmm. you know, OMG or lol or something, you know, that, that, these things become words. That, that's not a word, but you know, it's, it's come mm -hmm. from an abbreviation of some letters in you know, text messaging and it's become a word, you know, so that, uh, that, cha that changes the language. It, it introduces a new thing. Um, and the only reason that's happened is because of the technology of texting. Uh, and in the case of Sanskrit, you, you know, you mentioned that a lot of it is like oral tradition. Um, mm. is, is it still passed on in that way? Is it still like, um, you know, moved from generation to generation in this way? 
Yeah, there, there are still people who do that. I mean, it's less, less so than it was. So um, you know, ultimately, all, all, all Sanskrit texts have been written down and, and uh, there are manuscript traditions for all these things. And um, uh, you know, at, so, at some point, there was a transition to writing. And so a lot, a lot of Sanskrit literature, uh, let's say certainly in the last 2,000 years, has I suppose, probably or, originally written down um, and transmitted in, in that way. Uh, but yeah, there are still traditions of families of, uh, uh, mainly of priests, but not only of priests uh, with, who pass down, uh, pass down religious texts and also um, learn and memorize some of the other texts. So uh, some of the Indian grammatical texts, there's still a tradition of memorizing those and uh, passing them down. Um, so yeah, to, to, to some degree that still exists, but it's, you know, it's reduced a lot in the last, Let's say 100, 150 years, and um, perhaps is 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 still increase is still decreasing further. But uh, am I correct in saying that Sanskrit isn't the only language that you've looked at, or the, one of the, the Indian languages that you've looked at? Um, I work on a number of different languages. Yeah, uh, so Sanskrit is certainly the, the the language I've mainly focused on, but uh, I also work, work or have worked on um, Avestan, which is an ancient Iranian language, which is quite closely related to Sanskrit, um, but also Pali, which is the language of the um, Buddhist scriptures, um, which again is, is related to, to Sanskrit. That's an Indian, Indian language, of course. I mean, I have done uh, some work with, with a colleague um, on a modern Indian language, Siraiki, uh, which is spoken in Pakistan. Um, yeah, so I've worked on a few different languages. And do they share, you know, the, the same developments that Sanskrit has, you know, gone through um, over time? In, in, in what respect do you mean? In, in, so in terms of like with the com them being converted into, into written Sanskrit uh, or, or them being com converted into written language and, and how that's, you know, changed over time. Yeah, well, there, there's some yeah, there's some interesting uh, interesting things there. Uh, I mean, to say what to, to say something briefly on, to say something briefly on both Avestan and on on Pali. So on Avestan, um, that's a really interesting case because that was transmitted orally uh, for a very very long time, perhaps uh, perhaps longer than the early Vedic text before it was written down. But they had a much less good transmission system. So in India they developed uh, very, very accurate systems of transmission. Um, they developed different ways of reciting texts um, to make sure that they would never make a mistake. Mm -hmm. um, the, the Avestan texts, they didn't do that. So they, they transmitted them orally, but they ended up uh, making a lot of well, mistakes. And, uh, ch changes came in. Uh, mistakes were made, changes came in, errors entered. And uh, then it was written down at some point, the, the Avestan texts were written down, you know, possibly almost 2,000 years after they were composed. Um, and the writing system for that was a, a very uh, highly elaborate one, which was designed to, to pick up exactly how it was pronounced. Um, but it's, it's, uh, what, what it's left us with is a really um, quite a sort of interpretive game, trying to, trying to go right. back from what, what was written down to what kind of was originally there before all these changes and all these layers of, uh, of change over, you know, almost 2000 years came in. And it, you, you can do some of it, but some of it's guesswork um, in terms of both what it means and exactly what these words were originally like, what original form they had. Um, uh, Pali is another interesting case. I mean, again, that was a language, uh, language of the Buddhist scriptures where um, the oral tradition was predominant for a long time. It was a very different oral tradition from that of the early Sanskrit texts. Um, and that's reflected in, in the way the texts are constructed. There's an awful lot of repetition in the Pali texts. You know, they, uh, sentences are repeated over and over again. And that's a part of how um, the people who memorized it sort of remembered where they were and gave them time to remember, remember where they were in the text. Um, and yeah, and that, that was written down at a, at a much later date. Um, again, uh, I suppose not, not as accurately as the, the early Indian, uh, the early Sanskrit text, but, but much, much better than the Avestan text. And yeah, there, there, are, there are, again, interesting changes in there. Also with Pali, the, the effect of sound, the, the influence of Sanskrit, because mm -hmm. that was language around at the same time that was very influential. 
Um, and there are things in the Pali texts which uh, are, are clearly, you know, the words have been changed to make them more Sanskrit-like. Um, and you can, to, to a degree, you can undo that. Um, but that's coming at some point. And, and some of that has come in during the written tradition rather than during the earlier oral tradition. Mm -hmm. uh, where do you, um, where, where would you like to sort of take your research next? That's a, a good question. So, uh, I mean, at the moment, I'm uh, what in the, in the second year of five of a, of a big research project uh, looking specifically at the, the ancient Indian tradition and comparing it with the modern Western linguistic tradition. So that's going to keep me occupied, occupied for a while. And I, but I think that, um, I think that that, that area, but also, uh, you know, the linguistic analysis of, um, of the early Sanskrit texts, I mean, not the very earliest. So what, what I worked on mainly before is the Rig Veda, which is the, the, the single very earliest Sanskrit text, um, and has been subject to a lot of research for that reason. You know, it's, it's, noticeably older and more archaic and quite different from what comes later. Um, and sort of in the middle, there's these, uh, what are called Vedic prose texts, which are again, very early, um, but they've, they've been much less well studied. Mm -hmm. And they also happen to be texts which are linguistically very similar to the, to the language that the Indian tradition, the, the, the Indian linguistic tradition is trying to describe. So um, I think that, yeah, investigating the Indian, the Indian linguistic tradition in the light of modern linguistics, but also looking at the language of, of, of the Vedic prose texts and with both those, both those glasses on uh, is something I'd like to do in the future. And if you, if, you, if you were to give like a word of advice to anyone that's interested in, in getting into sort of the study of, of Sanskrit or, or any of the Indian or, you know, lang or languages in general, um, looking at linguistics of ancient languages, um, what advice would you give them? Um, yeah, do it. It's, it's, uh, it's a lot of fun. Um, yeah, uh, well, le learning languages is always a good thing to do. And there's, uh, you know, there's a lot of resources out there for Sanskrit. Um, you know, there, are, there are online courses, there are online websites where uh, people are teaching this because it's, it's an important language. It's an important language in India. It's an important religious language in India as well. So um, there's a lot of resources to do that. Um, and then, uh, yeah, there's a lot of, uh, well, there, there's a lot to learn, there's a lot to do, but um, I, think, I think that learning, learning ancient languages is a, is a valuable thing to do and um, an important thing to do uh, because you know, there, there's so much there to, to, um, to learn, so much human knowledge that uh, it's, it's a shame to lose. So. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a good thing to do, and yeah, the, the resources are there, and um, or you know, come come to Oxford and study it here. What have been the biggest challenges for you in in sort of studying Sanskrit and and you know trying to trying to sort of grapple with all these concepts um, from from the past? I think that uh, for me, I suppose I you know I had a, a training in this sort of language all the way from from school, so I you know I did Latin at school, so. For me, the kind of structural aspects of, of language haven't, haven't been a significant problem. And for some people, they could be, because if you've never come across a language with sort of structure of Sanskrit, it, it can be a hard thing to get used to that. But I think particularly for, for studying Sanskrit, it's, it's not just the language. Um, it's that there are so many different aspects to understanding what's going on in text. You know, there's, there's culture, there's religion, there's history. And with India, there's just so much. It's so big and it's so broad um, and so diverse. You know, you have, you have different religions, you have uh, thousands of years of history, not all of which we understand terribly well. Uh, you know, we, we often can't date things very well in ancient India. Um, and then, you know, different, different cultural assumptions. And you know, so, so one, one challenge I find is just, uh, and I think this is true of anyone, you always feel like there's there's more to know about mm -hmm. India, you know, about about ancient India. There's always something you don't know about the religion or the ritual or the culture or the history. Um, however far you go, there's more to know. <laughs> so it, it never ends really, and, and all those things are important for understanding uh, what's going on in these texts. And and ultimately, they're they're even more of a selling point as to why people should you know look at it and 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 study it. 
Um, and I think what you're doing is really, really um, fascinating because, you know, it, looking back helps us to, to really develop a sense of like our, our languages in general and, and, and how we've come to, you know, understand languages the way we do. So I think your work is really, really interesting. And um, where can people find you online if they wanted to, to learn more? Uh, so well, if you if you search for John Lowe Oxford, you can find my find my website um, on the University of Oxford website, and uh, I have my my papers there and information about the projects I'm working on. Excellent, um, John. Thank you so much for joining me. I've really enjoyed speaking to you, and um, I hope we can we can work together at some point. Great. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's been been a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you for watching this video. Please help us keep the show alive by liking and sharing this video and by subscribing to the show and making sure the notification button switched on. For those of you who can help a little bit more, there's a Patreon link down below where you can contribute whatever you can. Every little does help and all the money will go directly back into the show. You can also keep up with our latest content on Instagram at The No Show Pod, as you can see on the screen. As you know, The No Show is an initiative designed to make academic research accessible to everyone. So do contribute to the conversation, leave some questions, have a discussion, and I'll make sure I get back to everyone.